This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry with agriculture broadcasters Orion Samuelson and Max Armstrong and featuring agriculture meteorologist Greg Solier. This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Case IH and your local Case IH dealer. Coming up on this weekend's broadcast, we put biofuels in focus. What lies ahead? Hello, everyone. Welcome to our broadcast here. Mr. Mike Pearson alongside me. I've been traveling, and I know you have, too. I have, Max. Where did you go this last week? Well, we went across some counties of central Illinois and central Indiana. I had the privilege of being on the program at the Association of Indiana Soil and Water Conservation Districts and at that farm show at Gordyville, Illinois. You know, there's a lot of field tile going in this winter. There is, Max. We talked to Jacob Hansacker a few weeks ago about it here on the show, and he said he has been busy all fall getting that tile in the ground for farmers. And you were at a meeting where you got an update on biofuels. I I was last week had the opportunity to travel to the Iowa Renewable Fuel Summit in Des Moines where I caught up with Emily Score. She's the CEO of Growth Energy and she was talking to me about the recent battles they've been having in the court system this past year over E15. We're defending our ability nationwide to, to buy and sell E15 year round. The oil industry sued EPA. We tried to help defend them in court and we lost. Growth Energy then filed a petition for cert to the Supreme Court asking them to take this up on appeal. The U.S. Supreme Court denied our petition and we weren't surprised by that, but we wanted to exhaust all of our potential legal remedies. We now have, and we have two pathways left. Either federal legislation and we, Congress changes the law, or EPA comes out with a new rulemaking. We think they absolutely have the ability to give fuel parity once and for all to E10 and E15. So this issue is done and consumer, consumers have access to a cleaner, more affordable fuel. In conversations with the EPA, do you think that type of shift is going to happen in this administration or should we be looking more at legislative action? It's a little early to tell. Certainly, this is something that's entirely consistent with the administration's climate agenda. Greater use of higher blends of biofuels means lower reductions in terms of our greenhouse gas emissions. That's a good thing for the administration. This is a relatively new topic for them. They didn't anticipate having to deal with this issue uh, when Mr. Biden came in. So we're in early stages of conversations, but I assure you the industry is very uniform in our chorus. We have to get this fixed and you've got to do it right away. On the legislative side, uh, obviously ethanol has supporters across the country. Is there enough critical mass to get something across the finish line in this political environment? Well, so we'll start with the first part. Yes, we have strong bipartisan support to remedy this, to get year-round sales of E15. Less than two weeks after the court decision denied um, the EPA's rule, we had bipartisan legislation introduced that quickly. So we've got strong bipartisan support. You know, this year is going to be tough legislatively because we're looking at midterm elections, so kind of political dynamics beyond our control. We're trying to be creative and constructive and, and see, pursue what avenues might become available. So it's really conversation with legislators, but also keeping the pressure on with EPA that can make this change. Emily, the ethanol industry has had a roller coaster over the past two years in terms of profitability, in terms of usage. Bring us up to speed. How does the ethanol industry sitting in January 2022? At this moment, not too bad, but it has been quite a roller coaster, as you say. Most importantly, fuel demand has returned. So we're nearly back to 2019 levels of fuel demand and ethanol demand. That's really important for us, of course. Um, when we look at kind of the policy environment, uh, one of the big things that this administration has to deliver for us, strong blending obligations for renewable fuel. They've come out with a proposal. It has a mix, it's a bit of a mixed bag. So there's things that we like, there's things that we need to see fixed. So a big part of our conversation with the White House is you've got to finalize this proposal, get strong blending requirements out there because it's consistent with your commitment to the rural economy and your commitment to clean energy jobs. That E15 issue that Emily was talking about is a blend of 15% ethanol in the nation's fuel supply. Currently, we've got about 10%. So bumping that to 15% year round would provide some more opportunity for ethanol sales. Last week was a busy week in Iowa, just a few blocks away from the Iowa Renewable Fuel Summit. Iowa Soybean Association was having their winter meeting. I had the opportunity to moderate a panel. We discussed fertilizer. We discussed policy. Lots of issues on people's minds this winter. Michael Dolt shared with me some comments that Iowa's Governor Kim Reynolds made about biofuel access. 
In her condition of the state, she outlined a comprehensive biofuels access bill. Uh, first, want to point out her leadership on this issue, dating back to this last session, introducing a bill that did fall short, but we were able to educate lawmakers on the importance of biofuels, ethanol, and biodiesel to the state of Iowa and the feedstocks that are used to produce those fuels, corn and soy. Uh, specifically for soybean farmers, uh, very supportive of this action and the bill moving forward. Uh, again, increasing access to higher blends of biodiesel. Um, and I think one thing I really want to spell out uh, to listeners is it's also a biodiesel production tax credit increase. Um, so it's going to support uh, the biodiesel producers here in the state. Um, we've all heard about renewable diesel coming online and the amount of soybean oil as a feedstock. Uh, those plants are going to suck up. Um, obviously, we need our folks here um, on our home turf to have access, that same access to soybean oil at a good price. So, Michael, it's hard to believe that folks in Iowa might not have access to renewable fuels. What were some of the hurdles that this bill might remove? Sure, and it has to deal a lot with the infrastructure and compatibility, uh, both on the ethanol side, less so on the biodiesel side. Um, most underground storage tanks, blender pumps, um, anything dealing with that fuel infrastructure, um, for the most part, is up to up to speed. So uh, B20 for sure, B20 plus compatibility, um, which it's a nice hurdle not to have. Um, but again, I know on the ethanol side, they're working through those provisions with retailers as well um, to knock down those hurdles and, and increase that access. That was Michael Dolch, the Director of Public Affairs with the Iowa Soybean Association, and he was also excited about renewable diesel. Well, the soy market has been on a run recently. Joining me this week to discuss it is Dwayne Bussey of Bolt Marketing. And Dwayne, lots of volatility this week. What happened in the soy market? I, I think for the most part, I think what we saw is China coming in, buying some more soybeans uh, before their Lunar New Year. They've got their, their week-long holiday coming up here this next week. So I think they were in buying some, a little bit of drought concerns in South America again. But I think it's important to point out, I believe when China does buy from us, they buy new crop soybeans, not old crop. And, and that's actually a little bearish to me. I, I'm a little disappointed with the, the amount of purchases they've done with our 2021 crop. But uh, I guess China purchases are China purchases. It's not a bad thing either way. They are. And Dwayne, could they be holding off on old crop soy purchases from the U.S. because they're waiting to see how this Brazilian crop materializes? You know, I I don't think so. I, I think what it is is they're going to buy more of our new crop and get that on the books if the South America crop continues to deteriorate. And, and you've got a lot of estimates all over the board as, of what size of crop the South America soybean crop is. Of course, Argentina with the massive drought, southern Brazil. Now, we've had recent rains and, and should have stabilized the crop, but I think the market's trying to catch up to. We'll just how big of cuts do we have to make you up at these levels we're trading obviously a sharply lower crop than what usda printed last month yeah that is certainly true Dwayne. given the uncertainty in the soybean market and the volatility do you have any price targets you're keeping an eye out for to uh, get some sales on the books for either new or old crop uh, actually, this last week, what we concentrated on was the old crop sales. Uh, we've been holding and holding just with a bullish attitude, but th this is high enough for me. Um, sadly, before we made the new contract highs, I was tell recommending clients to go ahead and sell the old crop supplies. Um, it's just the basis is starting to widen out, uh, P&W basis widen out. It's telling me that China isn't buying our old crop, so it's time to just let that go and be done with that. As far as the new crop sales, if you look at a spreadsheet and you're happy with it, I have no problem making that sale, but I got to be honest with you, the, the trader in me says, let's wait on this acreage battle and see what happens in the next couple of months. I think we should see higher prices. Yeah, there is a lot of potential in all of these markets. Dwayne, the wheat market has also been whipsawing uh, up and down over the past mm -hmm. two weeks. This past week up, down, is this just general fear of the tensions of uh, Ukraine and Russia starting to fade? Absolutely. That was that was the driver of the wheat market this past week was, you know, is Russia going to invade or not? And once you got towards about the end of the week, there was talk or rumors that Russia probably won't invade until after the Olympics. I, I think it's funny. We always look back and research to try to pinpoint uh, what happened in the past. And I, I guess years ago when we had the same kind of tension, Russia waited until after the Olympics to invade. And uh, yeah, really, when you look at it, Ukraine's exported a lot of their wheat already. Um, if Russia does invade Ukraine, I think it might be more of an export story in the corn market than anything. But but we'll see towards the end of the month when they sadly are expected to invade. You know, we do see winter wheat acres up this year, Dwayne, for producers who maybe increase their acreage. Boy, is this mm -hmm. a good time to get some sales on. 
Oh, I think so. I, you know, last time Russia did invade Ukraine, we had about a $2 rally and we, months later we took it all away. So no, this scare tactic, this spike up in prices is a good spot, especially the guys in the Eastern Corn Belt. Uh, that, that winter wheat crop should probably be sold. That's in good condition. Now, you know, in the Southern Plains, I know the winter wheat, the conditions aren't very good. We're sitting in a drought and you can see that in the cattle and feed report. A lot of the placements went up 6% during the last report. And I think that was just proof that cattle are coming off these winter wheat pastures earlier than normal. Absolutely. That drought in the Southern Plains, is that going to be enough of a catalyst to move wheat prices higher through this summer or spring? Uh, and it, it, the drought's going to have to stay there a little bit longer than over the winter, right? If you're going to have a drought on winter wheat, let's have it over the winter. You know, one April rain or late March rain, and it goes back to being a bearish situation, actually. All right. We'll be back for more discussion with Dwayne Bussey of Bolt Marketing when we return. This portion of This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by AgriGold, your seed ally in the field. With unparalleled options that perform on your farm, learn more at agrigold.com. Last week at the Iowa Renewable Fuel Summit, there was a lot of enthusiasm about ethanol. Well, we're talking to Dwayne Bussey about the markets. And Dwayne, how is the ethanol market faring here in 2022? Well, earlier, the profit margins were huge for all the ethanol plants. And of course, what happens when you're making a lot of money, you try to make more of it. And we produced maybe a little too much ethanol recently. The ethanol stocks report have skyrocketed over the last, I'd say, month, um, which could be a problem here moving forward. You know, once you get ethanol stocks high, gasoline stocks are high, uh, it starts to become a problem. And the profitability margins actually start to decrease for these plants. Crude oil rallying a lot makes you think and feel like ethanol margins will stay good. But boy, that, that crude market is hard to predict too, because a lot of that is rallied on the fear of Russia invading Ukraine as well. So that, that's a very speculative market right now and hard to, hard to follow and predict. It certainly is. Dwayne, the corn market overall this past week just seemed to be a follower. It was following wheat, it was following beans. What's it gonna take for corn to break out on its own? Oh, I think just a matter of time, really, Mike. It, it's a strong market with strong demand behind it. We had great weekly export sales again for corn. And I think when I when I look at South America now, I almost feel like the, the soybean South America weather scare is maybe behind us now. I mean, people are still talking about it. I know that was the big news this week yet, but we've got a big weather story in front of us for the second crop of Brazil down there in South America, obviously. So I, I, I think we're going higher here. I, I think you can continue to hold old crop and I'm still not selling new crop, even though I know it's very profitable, but the trader in me just says that this market's going higher yet. Dwayne, what prices are you targeting to pull the trigger on some of those new crop sales? <laughs> and the famous question where, yeah, yeah, you know, there's a gap that measures up to about that 683 area. And I'm looking for maybe the July contract to get up to that level. Now you get above, there's another resistance at 640. So anywhere from 640 to 680, me being a producer myself, I'm gonna have a really hard time not selling my old crop of corn at that levels. And once we talk this acreage battle here in a month, uh, I'll start looking at making new crop sales as well. All right, well, we've also got to talk about the livestock markets because things are moving over there, especially in hogs. Dwayne, what's going on in the hog market right now? Yeah, that hog market is wild. I mean, it's wild during a normal week, but this last week was just crazy. I think it goes back to just, we have less hogs here than we thought. And, you know, the last two hog and pig reports have shown that and we've, they've come in with more bullish numbers than even we anticipated going into those uh, reports with. That mixed with, you know, the cash market cutouts are going higher. So obviously domestic demand is good. And then exports have been really good. This last week, we had really great export sales. Um, you know, as far as is China going to buy, how is their hawker? That, that's a hard thing to answer. But the other thing I noticed when you look at hogs and soybeans, the funds, the index funds, the investors that are fearful of the economy, if they're looking for a safe haven, they seem to put money into corn, or I, so I'm sorry, soybeans and, and hogs. And you sure saw that the last two weeks. What prices are you watching on the upside for hogs? Dwayne, are, are records in, in shot here? I, I suppose they sure are the way the trade action is, but th that's kind of what I'm doing right now is just watching the trade action and it starts to look toppy. I'm definitely gonna jump on and say, buy some puts for your summer hog production here. I mean, these are nice levels and, and you think of the disposable income and inflation happening this summer. I, it scares me just a little bit that the, the uh, hog market and cattle market could pull down eventually this summer. All right, some risk always present in the markets. Dwayne Bussey of Bolt Marketing, thanks for taking the time to fill us in on what's going on. Hey, thanks. Chad Colby's look at agriculture technology comes your way next, brought to you by the IBM Watson Decision Platform. 
Combining AI with Internet of Things data to help agribusiness increase yields, improve quality, and drive sustainability. If you're anything like me, it's tough to find you without your cell phone. I'm that way. I need it for work, and it's great to have in case of emergencies. You don't want to be stuck somewhere in the cold of winter and have your phone battery go dead on you. Well, tech correspondent Chad Colby has been digging into that very issue, and he's found a product that might help you extend that life. As most of you know, the iPhone 13, that's the latest model. But what I want to talk about a little bit this week is some new accessories that might interest you. Now, the iPhone 13 comes in various sizes, as you can see here. They've got lots of different features, so if you're in the market for a new phone, be sure to check them out. But on the iPhone 12 was the first one to have something called MagSafe. It's magnetic technology from Apple that's built into the phone. It was originally created as a safety feature to get rid of the cords. Now they also have some other accessories too, like the cases which are designed for that feature as well. And they also allow you to have like a magnetic clip on wallet to the back of the phone. That doesn't really interest me. But the one attachment that has been out for, I would tell you at least a year, and I believe it or not, I haven't had one yet. And that is their new battery. They have an external battery that magnetically clips on the back of the phone to give you extra battery life. Well, I finally got my hands on one, and after using it, I just had to share it with you. It's about the size of a deck of cards, maybe a little smaller than that. And being in the Apple ecosystem, it just clips on the back of the phone and works seamlessly. Once you have it on the phone, the phone will actually tell you how much battery life is in the phone and in that external battery. The other thing I want to share with you is you can take your power cord, plug it into the phone like normal, and the power will actually go backwards through the phone and charge the battery. So if you need extra battery life or just want that added insurance when you travel, it's a great accessory. For This Week in Agribusiness, I'm Chad Colby. Thank you, Chad. I always rest a little bit easier if I know I'm not going to run out of juice. Running out of juice has been a concern for a lot of people with the current issues in the supply chain. Stay with us later on on This Week in Agribusiness. We'll be talking to Professor Bobby Martins from Iowa State University about just how he views these supply chain issues and how they might clean themselves up over time. Welcome back to This Week in Agribusiness. Education season is underway, Max. I understand you had a chance to check in with one of the giants in ag education. Dr. David Cole, retired from Virginia Tech, but still active on the speaking circuit. He often harkens back to his basketball playing days for an analogy. He, does. he says, we've gone through the cupcake part of the schedule. It's got to get a little bit tougher now. That's the way he tells farmers they need to watch out for complacency. They need to sharpen their skills right now. One of the things is complacency kills. It's like athletes, uh, or you know, we're on a winning streak, we get away from the basics. And one of the things that I've really seen, inflation, particularly in these land values, covers up a lot of mistakes. And so one of the things that I'm really seeing, and of course we're seeing at this conference, the real good producers saying, oh, we better have a good game plan coming up and we better get back to our basics and you know follow our fundamentals. I am seeing this and of course I've been through many of these cycles. It, it, remember, agriculture producers or businesses get themselves into problems in the good times, not the tough times. And the tough times you really sharpen your skill set. He mentioned those elevated farmland prices. I asked Dr. Cole about those skyrocketing farmland values. We're seeing here, particularly in the Midwest and the Upper Midwest, a lot of the government payment checks were capitalized right into land value. Who's buying land? We're seeing a lot of baby boomers, uh, producers, because they don't trust Wall Street. Cryptocurrency is kind of out of their realm. And so what we have seen is these land values, particularly in the past six months, have just escalated. Uh, but these folks have the financial wherewithal, do they not? Don't they have a good foundation? Yeah, absolutely, Max. And, and it's the difference between now and the 1980s. These same producers didn't have their financial legs under them. So when Paul Volcker raised interest rates at that time, it wiped a lot of them out. Now they have equity, and some of these folks are very good managers, and so they're able to uh, capitalize on you know purchasing the land. And while it may not give them a dividend, it gives them capital appreciation. At the Farm Futures Business Summit, several of the speakers talked about that risk of higher interest rates that hangs out there. Dr. Cole said he hopes 
We don't see the kind of rising interest rates we did back in the 80s, but... It's going to feel kind of tough because we've been so low so long. And so I'm telling agriculture producers when they do those cash flows and anything that's on variable rate, they better shock test it for, you know, half percent, three quarter, maybe even a percent interest rate increase. Now, you know what that's going to do? It's going to squeeze a already squeezed margin. Two years ago, we could handle it. Now, it's really going to challenge us. Uh, it's a cost of production. It should be put in there along with everything else in terms of seed, fertilizer, or fuel. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and one of the things, uh, oftentimes, we do not put the, you know, the cost of interest in there. And sometimes we don't put the cost of storage, nor do we put the cost of family living. And so we're really going to have to sharpen those budgeting skills. <laughs> And while we had Dr. Cole, we asked him about all of that talk last year about tax law changes that was coming out of Washington. Did that prompt some people in agriculture to immediately take some steps to protect themselves? It picked up steam, particularly this last fall. Of course, after things kind of fell through, it's you know gone on the back burner. But I tell people, it's not about the estate plan. It's also about the transition plan to the next gen. And as I told the group today, when I survey young and beginning farmers and ranchers, you know, yeah, what keeps them up at night? Interest rates or weather, you know, inflation. But the number one, we don't know what mom and dad and grandpa and grandma have in these. They're holding us hostage. And uh, so I really feel, regardless of what happens in Washington, D.C., on the tax realm, a focus on transition planning is going to be critical. Dr. David Cole says it's also prompted many small town businesses outside of farming to take a closer look at what needs to be done, too. I would imagine many others called their accountants and their lawyers, uh, grain elevator operators, farm equipment dealers, multi-generational businesses, evaluating, oh, what needs to happen here if this tax acts does fall sometime. Yes, lots of things to consider, lots of moving pieces out there. And it, it reminds me, Max, of just how important the education season is for farmers, especially when things are changing so much in D.C. and at state capitals around the country. I, I call it the learning season. The learning but season. You said education season. It's the same thing. I like it. Are you traveling to, uh, to any good seminars or events coming I'll up? I'll be in Champaign, Illinois. The Premier Cooperative has its meeting there coming up. That'll be on the 9th, and I'll be moderating panels there. And yourself? Well, next week. I'll be headed to NCBA, the big cattle convention down in Houston. We'll be talking to a lot of folks here in the beef industry. We'll bring some of those stories up to air next week and in future shows here on This Week in Agribusiness. And then, yes, I get to travel. I'm excited going up to Dickinson, North Dakota in mid-February to talk about ag issues with the Chamber of Commerce up there, as well as Central States Agency in Buffalo Center, Max. So I'm excited to get to really connect with growers once again here after this volatile year. You know, when you visit, as we've had the chance to do in recent days, you really get a lot of feedback on how they feel about things, issues they're concerned about, things that they are addressing in their farms. It's, it's really a great time for us to uh, yes. be a sounding board for some of the producers. It really is. And Max, you know, one of the biggest concerns I've heard across the board is inflation. Everybody's looking at prices right now, and they're trying to, to get a handle on where they could go as this year rolls forward. And those supply chain issues, we got a good briefing on that just a few days ago. Coming up here, we'll talk about that as This Week in Agribusiness continues. We hope you'll stay with us. Greg Solier has his weather forecast just around the corner, too. Also, we'll get an update on Commodity Classic. Speaking of meetings coming up, that's one that's on our schedule to be sure. We'll talk to a couple of growers, one from Kentucky, one from Missouri. They're co-chairs of Commodity Classic. This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry, is brought to you by Case IH. Welcome back to This Week in Agribusiness. Folks, thanks for making us a part of your weekend. Max, supply chains are one of the major topics of conversation right now around the world. Boy, there's a lot of issues going on, aren't there? Including those in agriculture. We wonder about the availability of crop protection chemicals perhaps being affected to some extent by supply chain issues. We got to visit with an expert about that a few days ago. Dr. Bobby Martins has been an economist dealing with business issues over the years, supply chain issues specifically. Now he's taking a look at agriculture as well. We visited with him at that Farm Futures Business Summit and asked him just when this problem will start to subside. He said possibly by the fourth quarter of this year. 
It really depends upon consumer demand. A lot of what we're seeing with our supply chain right now is the impacts, or there's multiple impacts, but a large impact is the change from buying services, us as U.S. consumers, to durables. And that has been a major strain on our port systems and our, on our supply chain systems, which have been for years, for 30 years or longer, designed to be very efficient in what they're doing. And that efficiency is good, and they were designed the right ways, but that efficiency does not always lend itself to flexibility and agility when we see major demand shifts like we have experienced. Dr. Martins noted that the ports and the inland transportation system have been performing rather well, actually. They have handled record amounts of tonnage. The challenge is the employment base to be able to keep that moving and continuing waves of COVID striking international locations or original locations and also hindering what we can do. There's been a lot of focus on those vessels, ocean-going vessels, heading back to Asia empty. How big a concern has that been? Yeah, you know, they're doing what makes sense for them to do right now. What makes sense for them to do right now is to go back empty, reposition, and bring head hauls back into the United States where we are demanding all of these durable goods. Now, that is a challenge, and it's hard to see those vessels going back empty because that's empty capacity that could be used for something. Agriculture benefits from that. But the steamship lines, the container companies are doing what makes sense for them to do financially, and I think that's part of the market working itself out. The shortage of drivers for the trucking industry has been blamed for much of the problem in things getting to us late or not getting to us at all. But Dr. Martin says upon further examination, there's something else going on here. There may be enough drivers, but they may not be driving enough. They have 11 hours in a typical day to be able to drive. They're only driving six and a half of those 11 hours because of utilization challenges within the supply chain. They're not getting loaded, they're not getting unloaded, they need to break early, all sorts of things like that. Interestingly, if those drivers could just add 20 minutes to every day of driving time instead of dwell time, we would not have a driver shortage issue in this country. Dr. Martins told us that rising interest rates could bring a new focus to the supply chain concerns depending on how much the rates rise. As the cost of carrying an inventory would climb with the rates, processors and manufacturers would worry about their rising cost. He says we certainly aren't at that place just yet with interest rates. Greg Solier now brings us his farm weather forecast for the week ahead. Presented by Pivot Bio Proven 40. Predictable. Productive, weatherproof. Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at pivotbio.com. Some people have been checking the schedules to see if they can catch a plane out of town, a train, plane, <laughs> bus to a warmer climate. Yes. So you're not among those, are you? No, I wish I you were. Have to but stay no. here and keep us together. Do uh, what, what did Earl used to say uh, here to protect and serve. And so that's doing uh, exactly what we're doing and get paid to do. And it's a pleasure to do for all these years and try to keep everyone safe out there. And uh, the western states, a different story, not necessarily safe into Southern California. A little spark up of fires there. Remember back in December when we had a plume of these weather systems out across Pacific? Well, they are scant and few and far between this week. There's still more bitter cold through the Canadian prairie. Frontal boundary here on the move will drop some of the rain, snow, maybe down to sea level uh, areas in the Pacific Northwest. Not a big deal compared to the storms back in December. Pretty quiet high pressure across Cedar Mountain West. We see a little rain snow system and some milder air where the snow cover is kind of lacking here and points south and westward. Pretty substantial to the Red River Valley of the north. And here comes the bitter cold. The old one two punch for a change. Few and far between these storms into the northern plains this year. So we've got a cold front, the Arctic air and organized snows where we kind of need it across some of these uh, drought ridden areas and the lack of snow cover as well colder across the Mountain West, but again, little if any significant moisture northern California into the Pacific Northwest. A weak anomaly of a system down here into the Central Valley has had that Santa Ana flow last week. We'll see if that materializes later on this week. Delightful in the desert southwest. That's the place to escape to for now. Pretty quiet and mild environs across the winter wheat belt. Yes, the drought is there and it is intensifying again, but hopefully livestock managers take note now the change in temperature and there is moisture from 
Carnival rain snow mix over to snow across the Cordhusker state showers and thunderstorms. Then the ice and snow monitored accordingly. Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas. Look at the windy colder weather building on in and with time we'll turn those winds northeast. They'll blow into Southern California. There is Max your Santa Ana effect a little later into the week across parts of California. With the power of that frontal movement, some folks may start the day pleasant, maybe without a jacket and then we can see the temperatures drop. That's right. Layers on top of layers on the old Carhartt material. And I think you will need that here this week. Again, a fairly mild environment. Some thong across the uh, Corn Belt. Note this weather system, the Arctic air and breaking out some rain and snow. Pretty good coverages as well across the northern and central plains, parts of the western Corn Belt. Later in the week, there is that one two punch max and the drop in temperatures back into modified Arctic air. And we have not seen many of these storms across much of the Corn Belt central areas. A rain to ice to organize snow and accumulating snow anticipated west to east over the middle and late portions of the week plan accordingly. Cold air banked up across areas of the divide and into the southern plains as well. We start the week off warm, delightful, maybe the Gulf Coast a place to escape, but note the showers and thunderstorms. That's good news with dryness and drought in mind. Maybe not the temperature drop though, and it will be dramatic. One of these blue northers and will organize the rain over the accumulating snow all the way into the Red River Valley of the south as showers and thunderstorms propagate across the Gulf Coast and that Bend to the upper level wind currents, Max, a signature of maybe severe weather down there. In the Great Lakes area, will there be some lake effect snow? Uh, there will be. Had that last week, even on the uh, Illinois, Wisconsin side of things, and later in the week uh, into areas of Michigan and Ohio towards the following weekend. For now, cold weather here, moderation in temperatures, and a messy mixture of precip breaking out across much of the Corn Belt. That will organize into a snowstorm or two from the Great Lakes all the way down past the Ozarks into the Ohio Valley. Some showers and thunderstorms and a rapid snow melt along with the warm up here in the northeast of New England and some rain in the forecast there as well. Over the southeastern part of the country, a little rain snow mix into the Appalachians. Delightful weather across the Gulf Coast, Florida, another place to head out to. Note the low pressure and the cold front on the move. That will generate wide and expansive showers and thunderstorms over the Gulf Coast and the rain changes to organized snows from the Ozark southward into Oklahoma. Greg Sonia is back with his extended farm weather forecast for the country presented by Pivot Bio Proven 40. Predictable, productive, weatherproof. Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at pivotbio.com. He came into the studio bounding with excitement because of what <laughs> lies ahead for us. All of the weather woes we'll face. Uh, that's right. You name it, it will come down. The potpourri of precipitation is in the forecast this week, uh, Max. And for some folks who have made it through relatively unscathed from the winter storm standpoint, uh, well, the other boot and or hoof shall be dropping here. We've been talking about that. Remember, on these longer range forecasts, we're not done with winter by any means. Look at the moisture, one to two inches, whether it's accumulating snow, we melt it down or showers and thunderstorms over the southeastern part of the country. Yeah, there'll be an icy mix at times in this particular corridor, accumulating snow from oh, the Texas Panhandle across much of the Corn Belt into the Great Lakes region, half a foot or more maybe in some locales, even some lighter snows back across the plains and some scattered uh, moisture, perhaps in a couple of spots, upslope conditions into parts of the northern and central Cascades and the Rockies. Otherwise, there's just not much going on in the western states, but plain states on eastward, a different story, Max. A little relief from the cold somewhere here once we get into that uh, week of February 7th. Come on, a little relief. Oh, oh, a moderation, moderation. I hate using the term uh, warmth, and there is a little moderation in some of this barbaric cold that at times has made it into the parts of the central uh, Corn Belt and Plains. Here is some warmth here, a few degrees below average. The cold air is dominant. It'll be ebbing and flowing back and forth, but mainly anchored across the Canadian Prairie and times a bit below average across the western states. And the pattern is still active. It's still winter time, and another round or two of your accumulating snowfall. Great Plains into the Corn Belt into areas of the upper Midwest as well. Precip is welcome in some of these drought areas too. Normal moisture for the southeastern part of the country is still high and dry. That is normal for La Nina in the southwest and unfortunately into the valleys of California. For the week of Valentine's Day, that's the week of the Louisville Farm Show. It can be wintry, we know, recalling from past experience there. Yes, it can be, but at the same time, maybe some areas of the country, good snuggling weather with your Valentine, but note how the cold air for now kind of eases up to 
the north and northeast, a more seasonal typical February feel across much of the plains, the Corn Belt, Ohio Valley into the southeastern part of the country. Nice to see temperatures recover here coming off some recent frost that made it all the way down to the north end of citrus, uh, uh, the Florida Citrus Belt. Note some of the warmth across the southwestern part of the country. Enjoy that while you may. Uh, below average moisture, no change here in this La Nina setup. The weather systems are weaker and generally focused over the eastern part of the country, including some additional moisture, rain here, snows for the upper Midwest and Great Lakes uh, region and in the northeast New England and across the Canadian prairie and across sections of Big Sky Country as well. The final full week of February, what do you see there? Uh, the conclusion of meteorological winter time and uh, well, we can get, uh, wish we could get the spring here quicker than we can, but it is what it is and here is the cold air laying on out. This could be the story here now in the weeks to come. This is probably a pretty good snapshot of March as well. We do not, by the way, see an early spring, and it is going to be a wet spring. Hopefully we'll have that spring forecast here in the coming weeks. Note the warmth over California into the uh, southern plain states as well. The moisture pattern is like this. Northern plains, upper Midwest, Canadian prairie across the Corn Belt. Some late season snows, if you will. Moisture is welcome in the southeastern part of the country. Watch the dryness, the drought, and the fire risk building across West Texas, the southwest, and more so into Southern California. Next on This Week in Agribusiness, it's Max's Tractor Shed, spotlighting another great American tractor. Well, it certainly doesn't look pretty now, but like a phoenix rising from the ashes, we predict that those tractors will be coming back someday. Max's Tractor Shed brought to you by Storelock Tool Cabinets. At an exhibit the other day, I heard a lady ask the Storelock salesman, can you move those cabinets around? You bet you can. You just lift the latches on those two wheels with your foot. You move it where you want it. You push the latches back down. It won't move. It will stay put. Storelock.com. We've seen fires on farms through the years. Combine fires, tractor fires, House fires, barn fires. This was the scene near Baraboo, Wisconsin a few nights ago as the shed burned on this farm. I got the story from Mike Turner. He said he and his wife there about three weeks ago had a terrible start to the new year. About 10 o'clock at night, Mike's wife awakened him. She heard a noise. It might have been an explosion of a tire as their machinery building was burning. The Farmall 460 was one of the tractors in there. I think there was a pulling tractor, a newer, higher horsepower farm tractor, and Mike's grandfather's first tractor, a bee, was in there. He told me they'll begin the salvage work soon when the weather gets better, and I think there are plans to do some restorations all right. There's some better, brighter days ahead for the Turners and their tractors at Baraboo, Wisconsin. Mark Stock comes in every week to give us the lineup for the Big Iron Auctions. Let's go to Mark now. Well, Max, after the first of the year, the equipment selling on BigIron.com has been super hot. We sold a 2018 Rogue Gator RG 1300cc from Minor, Missouri for $152,000 to a bidder from Wisconsin after receiving 198 bids. Sold a 2013 Caterpillar 660 tandem axle semi truck tractor in Norman, Oklahoma for $91,900 to a bidder from Illinois after 233 bids. The John Deere 7210R mechanical front tractor selling in Lakin, Kansas. This tractor sold for $137,750 after receiving 52 bids. Equipment market is really, really hot right now. And on February the 2nd, we'll be selling a 2018 John Deere 6155R mechanical front tractor in Roxboro, North Carolina. There's a 2008 Case IH 2588 combine selling in Lloydminster, Alberta, Canada. There's a 2001 Caterpillar D10 our crawler dozer selling in Mineola, Kansas, and check out the 2014 Peterbilt 389 semi-truck tractor selling in Buffalo, Wyoming. The machine only has 515,000 miles. We're now listing equipment that will sell in March and April. Get a hold of your big iron rep for more information. We love getting to know FFAers across the country, and this week we're meeting Kelly Baird. She's the state of Kentucky's FFA vice president. And Kelly, what are you excited about looking ahead to 2022? 
Absolutely. So just starting this year, we're going straight into FFA week next month during the week of February, the February 20th. And I'm absolutely excited to be able to travel across the state, meet different FFA members from almost every region across the state and see what they're doing within their home chapters. And One that, of my favorite events during FFA week is the Spencer County Invitationals where chapters from all across the state can come and compete against each other. And that's just the beginning. And then we can work all the way to convention season in June where we will finish off our year. That is fantastic. And Kelly, I imagine that ability to get together with other FFAers was a key part in what prompted you to join in the first place? Absolutely. So my have the traditional FFA experience. My dad is an FFA advisor. So going all the way through my childhood, I was almost born in a blue corduroy jacket from the moment that I came home in the hospital to when I actually was able to join my freshman year of high school and then actually ended up running for state office this past year where I was able to realize what I could do for FFA members all across the state and to be able to see that their hopes and what they would like to do within the own jacket themselves. That's fantastic. And Kelly, you are hoping to stay in the ag industry. I understand you're currently enrolled at the University of Kentucky. What are you studying? I'm currently studying agriculture, economics, and animal science and business, where I'm hoping that personally I'll be able to work somewhere in the dairy industry within business. One of my dream jobs has always been to be an own professor of dairy science, where I can go back into the classroom and teach myself what I love to do, which is dairy cattle. Being showing, writing a children's book series about dairy education and dairy cattle has just always been something that I hope that I can turn into the others as I grow older. That is fantastic, Kelly. We need great young minds moving into agriculture, so we wish you all the best as this year goes forward. Thank you. That's Kelly Baird. She's the Kentucky State FFA Vice President. Well, it's an event that many farmers look forward to every winter, Commodity Classic. And it'll be coming up not too many days from now to visit with us about it, co-chairs for the event. We welcome into the broadcast this weekend Jerry Hayden from Kentucky and Gary Porter from Missouri. Jerry, we know that uh, Classic has been in New Orleans before, so it'll be good to be back there. A great dining city, isn't it? In 2016, we were in New Orleans, and we set all kinds of attendance records and so we're looking forward to maybe doing that again. We know the associations come together there Gary including yours the National Corn Growers but it's a it's an important event for the membership to come together and to discuss concerns isn't it? No that's right we can't wait I mean we've been waiting so long to meet together again and and meet face to face and get the farmers shaking hands with each other and sharing a smile with each other and it's just things that we are really really looking forward to. Jerry, we know that Kentucky growers, as well as many others, come there to take a look at the equipment of the various exhibits. The trade show is an important part of it, isn't it? It sure is. Uh, we, uh, we've got a full trade show, so there's a full line of equipment. 380 plus vendors are gonna be there. So if you think about it, it's gonna be there. And all of the uh, uh, managers and the engineers and all those people that we need to talk to to get, get our answers are going to be there. There's also that opportunity to, to learn quite a bit. I would imagine, Gary, you and, and fellow Missouri uh, corn growers and others from across the country will sit in a lot of educational sessions. There's, there's a, quite a, uh, a grasp of what's going on in agriculture that a lot of producers can take home. It is. It's going to be a great time. I mean, like every commodity classic we have every year, it's just going to be a time that you not only go down there with warmer weather and go to a different city that you maybe haven't been to before, but to be able to go to 50 learning sessions where you be able to, uh, to perfect way how you farm, uh, different things of farm, your tax planning, your uh, uh, passing on the farm to down to the youth and just all kinds of things that we're putting together, 50 of them that you can sit in on. They're free. You go to them, you sit in, learn on it. And it just be something really great that everybody can go. I've heard uh, lots of farmers that come from Commodity Classics say one of their most favorite part is setting in on a learning session and, and, and making getting better knowledge for their farm when they go back home. Jerry, do we know what COVID requirements will be in place in New Orleans? Will there be testing? Will there be proof of vaccination required? What do we know about it now? Yes, sir. We, we're planning 
so that everyone uh, that goes is safe. And our COVID safety plan and health and safety mm -hmm. guidelines are to ensure that everyone has a fun, safe event. Uh, masks are required in all indoor spaces in New Orleans. Proof of vaccine or negative COVID test is required at the indoor venues. We're working with professional uh, firms that will provide uh, vaccination verification before you leave home. So you won't have to stand in line and do that once you get, get there. Gary, is there a website that folks can check so they can get the latest information about Commodity Classic and all of the schedule and everything else required? Exactly, thank you, Max. Yeah, the guidelines change daily. So you don't really know exactly what's gonna be uh, in effect by the time Commodity Classic gets there. So we've got our fingers crossed that, you know, it'll be something that everybody can deal with really good and it makes it make the show go so smooth. So if you have any questions, it's good to check in on commodityclassic.com and they'll update all the guidelines daily. So if anything changes, you can click on there before you leave and hopefully we have some good news. Gary Porter, Jerry Hayden, we look forward to seeing you in a few days in New Orleans. Take care. Thank, Thank you, Max. You. There you go. There's something to anticipate not too long from now this winter. No, it won't be long. March 10th through the 12th in New Orleans. Commodity Classic Max in person again. Put your list together of favorite restaurants in New Orleans. That's good advice. <laughs> we'll see you there, I'm sure. We'll look for you here next weekend on This Week in Agribusiness. We sure appreciate your joining us. Have a great week. Closed captioning for This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Kubota. Shape your world. This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Case IH. This Week in Agribusiness is produced by OMAX Communication in association with 22 Creative Group. We invite you to visit us online at agbizweek.com.